Hi, my name's Andy Colthorpe. We're here at InterSolar Munich. I um, hope you've been following our coverage thus far. Uh, we've got for you today a round table discussion, the title of which is Silver Bullets are for Werewolf Movies. Now the point of this is that a few years ago you'd hear all kinds of uh, hyped metaphors for energy storage. Uh, the leading one really being that it was a kind of silver bullet and a kind of catch-all for, for clean energy ambitions. Now, we think, obviously, energy storage is fantastic, um, it's a great industry, but we have to be real about what it can do. So what is a more apt metaphor, or perhaps a more apt description, um, if metaphors aren't really your thing, um, for what energy storage really is? And we'll start with Marek, um, to my left here, from Fluence. So, yeah, Marek Kubik, uh, Fluence Energy, so we're a Siemens and AES company, um, energy storage technology and services provider uh, around the world. Um, so, yeah, energy storage is called a lot of things, um, silver bullet, bacon, uh, Swiss army knife, to go through some of those, mm -hmm. Swiss army knife may be quite apt, mm -hmm. bacon I don't really uh, like, well I like bacon, but I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's an appropriate metaphor sure. because it sounds like something that's nice to have but not, not particularly you know, critical, it's a sort of add-on. So, as I was thinking about what, what is apt, we'll go from werewolf movies to maybe something like The Wizard of Oz. So, okay. Yeah. What, I, what I was thinking with this is energy storage is for the future like the heart of the Tin Man. Uh -huh. I think the energy system as we have it today is the Tin Man and it needs a heart. Right. Um, and the reason I, I consider storage the heart is that I think it is absolutely integral, it's crucial to the energy transition that mm -hmm. is going to occur. You can't get by it without it. How exactly that manifests itself, it could be in, in many different ways. There's a lot of things that storage can do, which mm -hmm. is why the Swiss Army knife thing is maybe also right. But it's, it's, in my view, absolutely critical to the kind of transition we're facing with the, the trends of digitization, decentralization, and so on. Excellent. Uh, Jean-Baptiste. Thanks for, for the question, Jean-Baptiste Carnefer. I'm Managing Director for uh, Zonon eServices. Mm -hmm. Uh, Zonon is, is a market leader for uh, battery storage in the residential sector and uh, we, we, we have this vision from uh, an energy landscape green and decentralized. And here, uh, uh, to answer your question, we think that's, that's a missing piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And if we have an, uh, just a radius came in, I guess uh, right now in, uh, in Bavaria there are not too much uh, uh, sun fit in uh, and, 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 then, and then you need that if you believe in this vision of 100% renewable uh, and real renewable. So I'm Scott, CEO of Red Tea. So we've been in the energy storage sector for 20 years. So we're probably one of the oldest companies in the space. Uh, a bit of background, we specialise in energy storage business models. So we're an expert. Um, and our core markets are around commercial, industrial energy storage behind the meter, big grid systems, and then off-grid. Uh, and I want to be quite sort of more controversial. I don't see energy storage as sexy. I feel to see it as the old piece, the old box. So people think there's a silver bullet, bullet in energy storage has been invented recently. Lithium as a technology was invented in the 30s. Mm. Flow machines which store energy in liquid were invented in the 40s. These are old technologies. The silver bullet is cheap solar and cheap wind. Mm. That's what's driving energy storage. So I actually think as an industry we're being a bit lazy and we're not using our brains mm. to model and business model economic returns to capture cheap, cheap, cheap renewables. I see PV, solar, and wind as cheap cash flow. Mm -hmm. And you've got to capture that cash flow, cash that money, get it coming out the bottom, and have a good business model. Mm -hmm. So I see we the flows, we've been doing this for 20 years, a couple of other companies too. That's a big machine that doesn't degrade. It's energy, a battery is power. Mm -hmm. You've got to look at your renewable source, your power, your energy, build it as one system, and make money. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. So it's a really, my metaphor is it's an old, boring, ugly box. <laughs> Excellent, okay. Well, it's good to have a range on these things. Okay, and uh, Emilien of Inno Energy. Yeah. yeah. So I'm Emilien Simono. I'm a technology officer for renewable energies at uh, Inno Energy. So basically, in a couple of words, uh, the mission of Inno Energy is to accelerate uh, the innovation and sustainable energy field in Europe. Um, and of course, uh, storage is one of the major field uh, of innovation uh, in those days. <coughs> and uh, well, to answer very concretely your question, um, I think after all these interventions, uh, not much to add. I think the missing link, I think, is, is some, something that is, is, is quite uh, uh, 
generically used uh, to describe the storage. I think I think it's a uh, missing link for the power system uh, stability, integration of renewables. I think there is also one thing uh, one step further is when we uh, think and we talk about electrification, okay? uh, especially uh, in transport, uh, but also when we are uh, talking about the Internet of Energy, for instance. I mean, this will uh, have requirements in terms of bringing in energy to uh, devices, uh, cars, and moving devices that are cannot be connected all the time. So storage is here a key technology for that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I'd like, I'd like to highlight that uh, uh, it's, it's also uh, the size of the business opportunity behind storage, uh, behind the whole uh, development of the value chain. So especially thinking about um, the um, uh, uh, manufacturing of, of storage devices and also in the downstream business, uh, uh, how uh, we, talk, we, we go from a commodity uh, storage with the community to, to an uh, uh, improved community because it's all the service that has to be delivered. Okay, thank you very much. That's a, a great initial sweep. Now, with the rest of these, um, we've got kind of some points to address in terms of yeah, what we're looking at and people's perceptions, um, people's level of education of energy storage. Now, I'm not going to um, put every single one of these questions to each of you as we did for that introductory bit. So, what I'll do is I'll throw out the, the concept and hopefully one or more of you will be able to jump onto that. So, um, yeah, I mean, one topic that came out recently was there's some kind of studies that came out and it was really looking at the role of energy storage in decarbonisation. I mean, to me, it seems like it's pointing out the obvious that if you charge a battery with like fossil fuels, then you're just using fossil fuel electricity, but in the battery. Um, but, you know, uh, as we're saying, this is still about a level of education. So. The relationship between energy storage, decarbonisation, um, yeah, I mean, is that something that people really understand? Uh, I mean, obviously you guys understand it. Is that something that the wider stakeholder and the general public understand? Um, yeah, if you could explain for us um, where you see energy storage as its role in decarbonisation. I think it's also adding, and I need to, to also uh, continue on your aspect storage is that simply an ugly box. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, a part of your answer went into that direction. It's a smarter box and there is a, for me something missing in your explanation is the fact that uh, everybody is talking about this 3D, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, decent for mm -hmm. decarbonized and yeah. digital. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the thing which is which was missing in your description. I, I guess was uh, provocative a little bit in, in, in this sense. Yeah? But um, to achieve this decarbonization, so you, you, it's, it's, uh, everybody's using the word prosumer. Yeah? I mean, the power is to the people and the end consumer. So yeah? prosumer and being self-consumed. Absolutely, this is what we need to achieve it. Yeah? If we only do big centralized uh, projects, it will not be sufficient. Indeed, it's part of the game, yeah? but it will not be sufficient. And, and the uh, digitalization mm -hmm. will help also to achieve this decarbonization. The point I wanted to make, and this mm -hmm. is what, what, what changed recently, also in the storage business. That we can do, we can interlink batteries, we can, these are smart batteries that are able to, uh, s s s the cost of the battery itself is decreasing, but also you can add use cases mm -hmm. that are on the batteries, and you can at the same time optimize the auto consumption of the battery and at the same time uh, provide good services. Mm -hmm. And this is something which is, which is new. Yeah. Absolutely, and again, I guess that speaks to the versatility of it as a technology. Yeah. yeah, so just to, well, to build on that, I guess that your first question there was around education. Do the, do the general public understand this? Right. And I think uh, yes, in a way, but not necessarily the way that we in this room actually understand that the storage works and adds value. So I think that the, the image is very powerful, the straightforward solar and, and batteries or wind and batteries. Mm -hmm. Um, but people are thinking about just arbitrage. It's so straightforward. I store it when it's there and use it when it's not, which is one of the challenges, one of the aspects that, that, that needs to be solved in moving towards this world of the, the, mm. the 3Ds. Um, but it's not the only one. And one of my favorite stories about this is actually going back to sort of beginnings of, of, of Fluence through one of our parent companies over 10 years ago now, um, putting energy storage in Chile mm -hmm. on a system that was entirely cold driven coal power plants provide, and these coal plants have to provide spinning reserve mm -hmm. uh, to the grid in case anything fails. You have a large loss of a line or one of these big units, hundreds, you know, half a gigawatt or something of power loss. Right, yeah. And that's an expensive problem because you build 
these systems to run smoothly at base load, and instead you were holding them back. And mm. putting in storage there has nothing to do with, at that time, renewables. Chile is now moving in with a lot of solar. But it's solving a problem there that is helping move towards decarbonization by essentially removing the, the need for, for coal plants to be providing flexibility, mm -hmm. ramping up and down, holding back generation, which is essentially driving them to run, uh, when they're like that, mm -hmm. a, a higher carbon output and a higher cost. So even in a system without renewables, it helps solve those challenges. And I think that's a really good illustration of the, the, it's not as simple as you've got you know, PV and, and wind and some form of storage here. That's one of the aspects, but there are many more dimensions to it, and I think that piece isn't quite as well understood. Much. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I mean, like, I think um, you know, one really good example of that is um, is really big grid scale batteries, and you'll see populist news reports that say it can only store power for four minutes. Well, it's only supposed to store power for four minutes because its role isn't to store power for ages and then to discharge it for it. You know, as we say. So yeah, so I mean, it's the, the different roles that the batteries play in the grid. I guess that's something that people still still need more education on. I guess. Um, yeah. You so guys, yeah. first off, I'll correct. We're, we're not just talking about batteries. We're talking about energy storage generally. So, um, so I, I think we've actually. I, I think there is an education issue, mm -hmm. and there's an issue education about decarbonisation and what energy storage is all about. So. We launched a five-minute YouTube masterclass yesterday. You did tell me. Which yeah. is like a, a, a Scott McGregor version of David Attenborough. I pretended I was talking to my two-year-old son. Uh -huh. And it's and it's comic animation. But it's actually very important. It is, I joke about it. It's very important that we educate not just the consumers, actually the people in the industry. Mm. Uh, and I'll be quite confrontational. I think we're lazy. Mm. I think the viewers of this and the people in the industry are, we are not thinking about how, you, how to use energy storage properly. And I'll go back to my boring box, and we actually have quite a smart box, sexy technology underneath. Don't tell anyone. It does, <laughs> does everything. But I'm, I'm being promoted here. But it is about using more renewables, more cheap solar. This whole movement is about accessing that more renewables, more solar, so that we can go to decarbonisation and it's cheap cash flow. Mm. So accessing that, I see a future where we will very easily, we have models now, we go to 100% renewables. Mm. Um, and if we use our brains about modelling storage properly and designing the right power and energy solution and cyclability and the right technologies, lithium batteries, when you want bursts of power, flow machines, which is like pump hydro in a box, mm. when you want energy and you design the solution with many technologies, not one silver bullet, we will end up with a marginal cost of zero for energy. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're going in the future. Um, so I think I do challenge that we need to educate better as an, as an industry. And I see investors and customers just copying each other and not thinking. Mm -hmm. We have to model this as a system approach of integrated sto um, storage and renewables. Um, and then it's very easy to achieve and everyone makes money. It's great. Absolutely. And, and I mean, it, you know, it kind of makes me wonder um, if increasingly, you know, it's, what it's going to mean to really... Are we going to see much solar without storage, do you think, going forwards? I, I think not on a distributed level. Mm -hmm. So I see a world where 60% is distributed, mm -hmm. wherever there's solar, the storage. Mm -hmm. so, and wind is what wind we love, but it's just much more complex in terms of the business model, but just as viable. Um, and then centrally, yes, you'll have central renewables, but that's a portfolio strategy. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it will all be balancing out. But the best model we like, some of the grid models we're doing at the moment, is solar and wind and storage. Okay. It's fantastic. I just get so excited about the numbers that come out of the model. Okay. It's really, really neat. Yeah. Um, well, feel free um, to elaborate. Uh, <laughs> we could be here for hours. Okay. <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's basically trying to get to the lowest cost of delivering the base load power. Mm -hmm. um, so in our models, we can see really now US 8 cents from a solution with storage 24 hours. Uh, I can see, not driven by the cost of storage, the cost of storage is already there from mm -hmm. all the applications we do. It's cheap enough, it works, the functionality is there, lithium flow, great. It's about those renewables as they come down further, which mm -hmm. they are, that price will plummet even further off the combined solution to generate energy. Mm -hmm. Where we are most excited about is the big grid models now with big grid storage assets where you have big amounts of lithium and big amounts of flow together. And you have a flexible asset not doing just the four minute service you talked about before, but doing long duration, short duration, lots of trading and have an asset that can do everything. 
and support that centralised portfolio. Um, so there's some great, great models coming out now. I mean, thinking uh, about the, how, how people are educated, the storage, I was thinking, what, what is the thing that, uh, what is the storage application that people are, are used to see in their everyday life? It's probably the electric car, because it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of what is more publicised uh, nowadays, you see in the car, in the streets and so on. And, and actually, I think people are, are uh, um, positively uh, uh, have positive feeling about that, uh, in the sense that uh, what we all know the uh, problems of air quality in our cities, and, and this has a local impact of, of improving this air quality problem, uh, even if they don't relate that to is it, ch is it charged with renewables, is it charged with uh, fossil fuels, because their goods are produced in, uh, in outside of the city centers and so on. So so I think that, that initially uh, storage is seen as, as a good technology. Uh, so that, that's, that's a very big uh, step uh, in terms of uh, educating people because if you take the comparison with photovoltaics, for instance, uh, as, as the start of photovoltaics in Europe 10 years ago, it was seen as a, cost, a costly technology. Uh, it, had, it didn't benefit from a very good social acceptance at the time. I, I think storage is different. Mm -hmm. uh, also because it's a, a smart device that you can have at home, it's, it's kind of a nice, fun, etc. Um, and then, then switching back to the to the industry or sector or pro professional sector, let's say, I'm totally sharing the point that there is a big deficit in, uh, in education there, mm -hmm. and uh, especially as uh, we, as an investor in new technologies, we are seeing many different uh, chemistry or many different storage technologies that have different capabilities and that could answer different requirements from TSOs, DSOs, uh, local users, etc. There is a need for an understanding, a general understanding of it's not a, an, a single solution for many problems, but it's probably a, a, a panel of different sol solutions addressing uh, specific problems of each of the players in the energy field. And, and uh, that's what is going to bring uh, the right uh, economies and scale in, uh, um, in, uh, in delivering the good services for the system, uh, frequency control, etc all those things, mm -hmm. uh, there is a need for a good benchmark of what solutions we have, what requirements we have, and then make, make a good match of it. Okay. Excellent. So back to the general myth-busting theme that we're tackling today. Um, and one you hear all the time is energy storage is too expensive and the only way you can really make big money from it is from grid services. So I'm hoping we get some opinions on this. Oh, for sure. I'm going to jump in on that one. Go um, for it, Mark. Yeah, the, the grid services is course one area and we've seen it as a low hanging fruit in many ways and that it's something the batteries particularly talking about fluence technology can do very well the speed of response the, the flexibility of it um, essentially means that you can displace traditional resources that have been providing this in the past the conventional thermal um, with a relatively small portion displacing a very large amount of that traditional market so it, it's a very easy entry sort of point to a market but yeah it's a challenging one from a business case perspective because you don't usually get very long-term contracts for, for that. We're seeing storage being used for a lot of more interesting things and there's two particular areas maybe I, I, I touch upon now. There's more I could go into but I don't want uh, uh, you know, to go on forever. So one particularly uh, started out in the US but now it's, it's propagating to other markets which is storage actually working and displacing traditional generation, traditional peaking assets. Right. which particularly in the US, sit there a lot of the time, run on average, uh, so load factor is maybe like 5%, five, five sometimes less. So 95% of the time, pay for an asset sits there to do nothing. Um, and the rest of the time, it then provides this, this ability to, to meet the peak demand. Now, storage can do that uh, just as well, and we're now actually seeing that the capital cost of, of something like a four-hour battery is already lower on an upfront basis than traditional peakers. Sure. And not only are you solving that problem, the battery is doing something useful the rest of the time, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, the duck curve in California or all the solar during the day that you're moving into the, uh, you know, into yeah. the evening, yeah. uh, whether it's frequency regulation, whether it's something else. So, so that's a really good example of, well, it's not too expensive, it's cheaper than the traditional solution. Sure. So it's already a... All these projects are commercial, so they, they have to, by definition, be doing something better than than's already there. Sure. And the second one I'll mention is also very interesting: is transmission and distribution uh, infrastructure alternatives. Right. right. Um, so we've seen a number of, uh, of sort of pioneering utilities um, that have deployed these sort of systems that we've uh, supplied to them. Again, they're sort of two to four hours, slightly longer duration, um, mm -hmm. so they're not just short duration frequency regulation batteries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're there to essentially defer investment 
that you would traditionally do into a substation to manage, say, a lot of solar being added at a mm -hmm. distribution level, and creating back feed issues. Mm -hmm. And the time value of money there is extremely valuable. Alternatively, mm -hmm. putting it in to be an alternative to building, say, something like a transmission line. And you can do that robustly. You can have an asset that's 20 plus years of life from a storage standpoint, and it will have that same infrastructure um, standing credibility. Mm -hmm. That opportunity is very huge because the need, as we're moving towards this decentralized, bi-directional world, mm. is significant. And, and storage, again, is doing those jobs better than, uh, than, than traditional uh, solutions. And when you're looking at that, that's where it's scale. Because mm. if you treat it as an infrastructure asset, there's a huge amount of infrastructure funding out there, low cost of capital, that if you can invest in a bankable asset like that, and that's the anchor revenue stream, that's the sort of future I see. Ancillary services will always be there, but that's what they will uh, be in the case of a lot of these business uh, models. There will sure. be an add-on to the side, but your anchor revenue stream will be something like this capacity need or the mm. or the T and D. Yeah, alternative. and that that T and D area, you know, it's been described as non-wise alternatives to yeah. you know that's the kind of phrase that's been thrown about. And yeah, just uh, to interject a little bit, yeah, we'd like to point people in the direction of, we've had quite a lot of content on the site, um, people talking about that, and obviously we don't have the numbers to hand, but there's some quite impressive estimations on what it could be, and it's, it's been a kind of, almost a theoretical sort of use for storage that's actually gone into, you know, the last year or two, it's actually really gone into utility planning, particularly in the US. Um, so yeah, so I'd urge people to take a look and look up what non-wise alternatives can mean for the grid, and also, sorry, just to, just to, just to finish that point a little bit, the so the four hour projects we're talking about was that's another example people can read up on and it might be a good way to educate themselves. Uh, this was so in response to 2015 October 2015 gas leak of Aliso Canyon was where a lot of it started I believe in California. There's a lot of capacity lost from from power from gas, um, and so a lot of energy storage products, some of them were already in the pipeline, were expedited and increased in size and capacity. Is that right? So, uh, I, I don't know about this piece, but they were essentially built very, very quickly in, yeah. in timelines that you wouldn't have got a traditional, like, uh, it, you know, it wasn't for storage, it was, again, it was just a tender for, we need capacity, we need it quick, how yeah. can you, uh, who can deliver and how? And um, those projects were you know, very substantial, so we built a couple, one 120 megawatt hours, one 30 megawatt hours, sure. simultaneously in about six months, mm. uh, in response to getting it online by the, the winter to meet that peak, peak, uh, peak demand. And it's on a, like the larger of those projects is still squeezed into a site of about an acre in size. Mm -hmm. So it's very compact. It's a site you wouldn't have been able to put a traditional asset on even if you had the timeline. And you probably wouldn't have been able to get a traditional asset permitted because mm -hmm. of all the, you know, it's close to a residential sort of business area. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, really interesting, um, uh, you know, case study of what you can do with, uh, uh, yeah. with you know, energy storage. It's kind of a, yeah, not to just big up you guys, but there's other companies involved as well, but it's the first real, well, not first necessarily in the whole world, but it's a big example of storage of capacity resource, I guess, and renewables as part of that. Yeah. Okay, sure. guys, can we, yeah, jump no, uh, Absolutely, and uh, at the end, what we're striving for is to uh, use green energy locally when it has been, where it has been produced, and, and a part of that is to uh, the self-consumption or mm -hmm. auto-consumption, it will be the traditional first use case, and then we try also to maximize the integration of the renewable. I mean, it's called the flexibility is the key, so to say. Huh? So, um, if you would look at uh, Germany, but I would uh, take also other countries, uh, the, the biggest cost for balancing the system is the cut element of the, of the uh, wind and PV. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, if you have uh, uh, this is not the traditional ancillary services as you would know it, yeah, but it is also part of using the flexibility. You have a, a decentralized asset, very flexible, and you multiply the use cases, it improves the overall business case for, for the end customer. Yeah. And by the way, for the society, uh, grid defection is, is, is not a topic right now in, in Europe, but this will come at some mm. point. Yeah. Mm. The side of the room, uh, anything to jump on? Yeah, so I think uh, obviously when experts in, in the business models as well as selling lithium and flow and I think what frustrates me a little bit on the business model side is is yes I agree the cost of storage is there now it's economic clearly across different technologies but I feel the industry is copying each other simple business models and the mm -hmm. business models are quite risky okay. so um, energy the energy industry is about infrastructure you know it's about low risk investment and to unlock energy storage as a full-blown multi-trillion dollar industry 
is to attract the pension funds to come and invest. Mm -hmm. And they That's want right. low risk investment. So if you're building assets that have tied to frequency results or only certain revenues that are considered merchant and everyone's copying that, those revenues are dropping. Mm -hmm. So you have cheap following cheap. Mm -hmm. If you build energy storage as infrastructure and you look at a flexible asset that does multiple things, mm -hmm. that is hedged, because the only guarantee we know in the energy sector is the government's change of policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only guarantee is we'll have unintended consequences and we'll have elections and there'll be stupid policy. That's, that's the energy policy, we all live with that. Mm -hmm. So you have to build those assets that are flexible, that can do and navigate anything over the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. So the models we have for our big grid storage with lithium and flow, we have diversified revenue, say in the UK, of five different revenue sources, so frequency is only 19% of the revenue. Mm -hmm. You have a flexible asset, you can do anything the market throws at you for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Similarly, commercial behind the meter storage, we look at basically the customer taking charge of 60% of their energy production. They use more solar, they only buy from the wholesale market, they take out their energy bills. Mm -hmm. And yes, they can deal with grid service and capture that money while there's policy now, mm -hmm. but that policy will change. So my view on this is when we're looking at business models, again, don't be lazy, look at infrastructure, don't chase business models for short-term policy. Mm -hmm. Because then everyone else chases it, and your revenue lines will drop, and you may have sold the asset and someone else's bad investment, but that doesn't help the industry. Mm -hmm. So think of investments as a 20-year investment. That's what the energy in, um, industry is about. Low-risk investment, then we will track, attract trillions of dollars mm -hmm. of money in from the pension funds, and then projects will go en masse, and we'll move to a clean energy society. So. Maybe I'll go off topic, or at least at the side of the topic, but I'll try to okay. with that as well. Yeah. Uh, a bit of a reaction to what you just said. I think it's infrastructure business, as, as uh, we all know, it's 20 years uh, time, uh, time horizon for investments. But uh, uh, we are in a massive and very quick transformation of, of the business in the energy field. No? So that's an added risk no? uh, to, to, to investors. And who knows uh, who will uh, own, operate, uh, what kind of business model there will be around storage in five years from now. Mm. Uh, I, think, I think one of the um, things that is interesting and uh, could be uh, improved in Europe is, is how we experiment on those business models. We mm -hmm. need kind of business model labs no, to, to say, okay, um, what if we do that and that, and try, trying different options. No? Uh, but, but to cover the general topic of the, of the, the potential be, behind the uh, storage technology, um, uh, I'd like to share some, something that is uh, happening in the frame of the European Battery Alliance, uh, that is a project that is coordinated in the frame of the European Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, it's agreed that uh, the market size related to storage technology will be of uh, 250 billion euros by 20, 2025. No? Uh, so I think that that removes any doubt on, on, on uh, it's, uh, business models, uh, business cases, business opportunities. I mean, it's here, it's here, it's here to, to stay. So one thing we were just saying is that a lot of the terms that we use every day in the industry are things that we kind of take for granted. Um, maybe they require a bit more elaboration and explanation. I mean, like Scott was referring earlier to behind the meter CNI market and anyone who's in the industry, that's something we're talking about all the time. But maybe, you know, people outside it are just not familiar with it yet. Um, so, I'll tell you what we'll do, seeing as how Scott brought it up, maybe if Scott wants to explain to us the behind the meter, mm -hmm. and then we'll hop over to whoever puts their hand up first to go through front of the meter. So, behind the meter is the market we're most excited about at the moment. So okay. that means you have a business and you use energy. So IKEA, Marks & Spencer, Walmart, water companies, all these kind of brands that we know, they use a lot of energy. And in certain industries, 90% of their cost is energy. Mm. So behind the meter means you're a business, you use energy, and you have a meter, and you're connected to the grid. What that means when you're talking about storage is you put on typically solar, maybe wind, but typically solar mm. on your IKEA store, and you put storage also next to that store. So you have the solution, the energy solution behind the meter. Mm -hmm. That's behind the meter that you're paying for for the grid. Mm. And our firm view is we can now model that 
in the UK and Australia, we firmly believe, probably Germany and Spain as well, mm. the US, where we can get an IKEA customer a, on average, 15% IRR, internal rate of return, mm. and a payback period of somewhere between four and 10 years. So it is now very economic for a commercial customer, commercial and industrial, or industrial and commercial, depends which consultant you talk to, different names, yeah. a energy solution where they generate and store, so low cost, around 66% of their energy. Mm -hmm. And then they go to the market to buy the other 40%. Mm -hmm. And that's not risk by policy, that's them having their own energy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that's what has been talked about since the 70s as distributed energy. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's explains that. Sure. And then obviously the other type of behind the meter is the kind of you know, residential and where you're self-consuming energy and it's essentially the major benefit of the storage is on the customer side. Yeah, so we, I'll be more controversial, we don't believe domestic energy storage makes money. So we don't in that business, we don't believe it makes money, okay, yeah. but I believe it still has a huge future. Mm -hmm. it's not, I'm a maths person, I'm an economics, I love money, I'm mm -hmm. making money. So for a domestic household, it doesn't make money to have storage, mm -hmm. but it's an emotional purchase. Mm -hmm. It's a consumer, it's a different market. Mm -hmm. I'm used to talking to businesses and talking about NPVs and IRRs. For mm -hmm. a consumer, yes, you want to engage in the en energy industry, you want to have your own solar, you want to have your own storage, it doesn't have to have as high a return as business mm. needs. Mm. So there will be a big future of domestic energy storage, mm. but it's a different behind the meter equation. Okay, now I really want to put this on to John Baptiste. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so we, yeah. we see that as a combination of both. Yeah? It's a, an emotional purchase and it has economic sense. If you look, uh, also you were talking about uh, infrastructure business, um, if you look 20 years ahead, yeah, um, and I don't even look, need to look so far away in a couple of years. Uh, you have in, uh, in Germany 1.6 uh, million households with a PV pump. You have the same in uh, Australia. Yeah? And um, I can tell you that if you're trying to sell your energy uh, on a sunny afternoon, uh, at 2 in Germany or in Australia, you will get zero euro. Yeah? And you might have to pay for it to get rid of your excess energy. So uh, we, we, we believe that this is a, a strong enabler and uh, it has a, a it's a social and economic sense to have a uh, decentralized storage uh, in the field to uh, realize energy transition and to, to have this, this uh, green and decentralized energy future. Yeah? It's, uh, I agree on the fact that the, it says the economical equation doesn't have the same uh, timeline mm -hmm. yeah? because if you are uh, an house owner, you can plan a little bit longer than if you're a company and you, you don't know if you will be financed uh, in two years from now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's a combination of both, yeah? otherwise people will, mm -hmm. will not embrace it. Sure, and I mean, the thing is we haven't even touched on sort of peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, mm -hmm. virtual power plants, aggregating lots of residential systems yeah. together, yeah. which again, you know, something yeah. that bit hard to predict, but that yeah. could change the... Uh, you know, absolutely, yeah. it is also participating to uh, increasing the, the economic value for the end customer that mm -hmm. you, you stack the different uh, value stream. And there is also, a, let's say, a more, uh, let's say, a societal perspective where you see actually what you want green local energy yeah? mm -hmm. and uh, to finish with an analogy with uh, let's say the uh, food industry yeah uh, i mean no at, at least in, in europe and in, uh, in the us in australia you want to have this uh, uh, organic food from uh, this is a, the local garden and this is uh, this is an analogy which is very valid for for, for the energy business yeah you want to have energy green and you want to see where it's coming from and you're not satisfied anymore with some kind of green certificate coming from Norwegian or whatsoever. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well let's do a quick uh, distinction on the front of the meter, what that means. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can take that. Uh, it's, it's probably pretty quick because it's basically the, the antithesis to, to, right. to, to yeah. behind the meter. Um, so there, there's certainly a lot of stuff, but I'm, just to say we also work both sides. We mm. similar beliefs in like, uh, the CNI space, the commercial industrial behind the meter. Um, there are certain things that you can only do front of meter. Front of meter would be um, basically where you're connecting the way a conventional generator would connect, either a distribution level or transmission level. Mm -hmm. So you're not self-consuming, you're not a, an energy user, you're an energy exporter and you only produce. Um, so that, that's the simplest way of describing mm -hmm. uh, front of meter and some of the things we talked about earlier. So if you're doing, for example, non-wise alternatives to mm -hmm. uh, transmission line or something, uh, 
those are the kind of assets that the sort of really big projects. So you have like a, a, a transmission line that's 500 megawatts of carrying capacity. Mm. It might actually have more capability than that. It might have a gigawatt of capacity. You can't use the gigawatt because of the um, you know the constraints and contingencies on the on, on the line. Mm. You put in a, a really big battery there for however long it's needed to cover that contingency and you know start up some alternative generation. Mm. Then that's the kind of project you'd have at that scale. It's these big sort of centralized, and I think both have a role. You have this sort of analogous to the, uh, the world of data. We have large data centers, mm -hmm. but we also have you know, storage in our pockets on our mobile phones as well. Mm -hmm. And those are sort of the two extremes, and you also have this stuff in between. So. Hey, so, all right. Pretty concise, thanks very much. Okay, cool. Well, I think, unfortunately, in the interests of uh, time, we're probably gonna have to wrap it up um, for today, I think. I'd really like to thank all my participants. I think it's been fascinating. Um, and yeah, we'd like to point you in the direction of, yeah, there's plenty of further reading on our website. Um, so yeah, so I'll say goodbye for now and maybe just leave um, with each of our panelists, just give us a, um, you know, maybe just a little uh, run through on what they're working on at the moment and what they're hoping that by this time next year, where we'll be, I guess. Um, bit of a stop journalistic question, but I hope you've, uh, you've all got something that you could, you could respond to on that. So right now, um, as I already introduced, InEnergy is working in uh, co-leading the uh, European Battery Alliance, uh, that is a uh, coordination of all the stakeholders in Europe, uh, willing to make sure that uh, this huge market is going to be uh, addressed thanks to European capacity, so in manufacturing, but also in developing uh, the whole value chain. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have worked in the last months very intensively uh, in developing uh, concrete actions and a uh, concrete roadmap on how to untap this potential. Mm -hmm. So I hope that by the uh, same time uh, next year, uh, well, this uh, will have already reached some concrete milestones. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, Hopefully, with uh, concrete uh, uh, decisions made already into mm -hmm. uh, several fields like uh, uh, regulation, uh, but also some uh, some uh, business decisions sure. uh, around uh, around, uh, around this topic. Marvelous, thank you. And uh, will non-European Union nations be able to benefit? Oh, I'm sure yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly hope so. Thanks. Um, yeah, Scott. Um, so we just yesterday launched our Generation Three technology on the flow machine. So. I I firmly believe it's the most advanced flow machine in the world. Mm -hmm. um, for those who don't know flow machines, it's like pumped hydro in a box, storing liquid. Uh, the specification sheets are fantastic. So mm -hmm. normally when you look at energy storage, you have a specification sheet, but it doesn't really always do what it says on the sheet. Mm -hmm. This is really powerful in terms of its functionality and we've embedded a lot of technology into it to make more money for customers. Mm. So we want our whole philosophy is use more solar, make more money, have your storage do something like an aircraft, so you want to run at 80 to 90% utilization all day oh, long. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's what we're announced today, we're starting to sell. Mm -hmm. um, those first systems will deliver at the end of the year. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're very, very excited. Excellent, and by this time next year, um, and not just talking about your ambitions for your own company, but oh, in terms of the education piece. So, and, yeah. so, so the last frontier for me, so commercial, uh, industrial energy storage, our models are brilliant, it works great. Great stuff, we've cracked in the last few months and it's really flexible assets. The last frontier we're really trying to crack is solar plus storage, as, as Mary says, front of the meter. Mm -hmm. So big solar farms and storage and wind. Mm -hmm. and get that lowest levelized cost of energy. So I want to see distributed renewables on that. Mm -hmm. um, now I think we can do that right now for about eight to 16 cents US, mm -hmm. um, depending on how much storage and solar you have. Um, in the UK terms, that's about 9p. So it's okay, but it's not you know, mm -hmm. that economic that you have billions of rushing into it. As that solar price comes down and we build more functionality in storage, and when I talk about functionality, it's about using more storage, mm -hmm. using every minute of the day and making more money, mm -hmm. then I think we'll see that come down to the four or five cents range, the four or five P, and then you take out all coal, all nuclear, we have mass centralized renewables as 24 hour, 24 hour baseline power. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very exciting. I know there's been number of examples around the world where you have solar farms and you have, these phase batteries, 
To me, that's marketing because it's a solar farm and an hour battery. That's not base load power. I'm talking about okay, yeah. solar and storage, which gives you 24 hour power mm -hmm. generation mm -hmm. as a 24 hour power generation facility. And when we get that down from eight towards five, four, five P, mm -hmm. that's game changing for the mm -hmm. energy sector. Mm -hmm. And you'll see lots of investment. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I did say by this time next year, but when do you reckon that will happen? We'd like to do a first project in the next 12 months. We're looking at okay. projects in the UK and Australia. So it, it is economic. Yeah. So there are businesses paying in the UK terms, 11, 12 Ps. We do it for nine, they're making money. Mm -hmm. um, but on mass, it's, it's simply a function of solar price. So all our models going forward, storage cost is already there. Mm -hmm. The storage cost reduction doesn't really enhance the returns that much. It only puts it up one or two percent. Mm -hmm. But it's a PV cost. Mm -hmm. As PV is coming down, that cost of generation comes down, and that's what drives up the speed of the industry. Uh, so I could see in 24 months, 12, 24 months on mass, mm -hmm. big solar, 24 hour base load power generation. So that's uh, yeah, a little bit longer timeline, but that's yeah. still pretty damn good, isn't it? Yeah, excellent, excellent. Okay, so let's go down, down. So Jean Baptiste, please. Yeah. yeah so we are. In, uh, we continue the journey towards uh, clean and affordable energy, and and for Zona, it means two things: is uh, what's on uh, scaling and, and the growth expanding also in, in, in other markets like Australia, US, uh, Italy, UK. And on the other side, continue to uh, innovate at the best uh, product in the field and find the best use cases. And uh, as let's say the personal goal, I, I will take develop also the, the usage of flexibility in the decentral world. Yeah, in the central world, it's existing today. In the decentral, uh, this is for me the future, and this is still this is starting. So I will be glad to uh, talk to you in uh, in, in, in in one year yeah. and uh, show even more project and then usage of the flexibility in, uh, in the decentral world. Terrific, thank you. So finally, Mark? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, Fluence as a joint venture was only launched in January, so this is the halfway point we're sort of marking now in the year. It's been, yeah. uh, like, what I would like to see, I think, at the end of the year is an extrapolation of our first six months. There's been a, a whole swathe of, uh, of new projects, uh, all sort of hot on the back of each other. Um, the largest portfolio signed with a single client in the UK for uh, large scale front of meter projects there. We've had uh, uh, again, a repeat customer, one of the ones in California, uh, four per project, for 40 megawatts for our system. Um, we've had a lot of other smaller ones um, as well. We've had in Australia really big uh, uh, alliance announcements between Lion, uh, Jera, and influencers. Yeah, you know, yeah. So a lot of stuff has happened, and a lot more is, is coming. And um, I guess what I would like to see is well, just us living up to, to our mission, like the company's uh, mission statement is transforming the way we power our world, and, you know, essentially to enable this uh, you know, clean energy future. Um, so we're off to a good start in the first six months, I would like to see a lot more um, in the next. Excellent. As again, just to say thank you very, very much to my esteemed panelists, and I hope you've enjoyed watching. Thank you very much.